With that, I'm going to turn it over now to the grand finale. This is my friend and hero of the last 200 years. Is that what we're looking at? A long time. He's helped me design so many homes and overcome so many building officials. And uh, the podium is yours. Thank you. So I, in many ways, I might be the cheap washing in this thing, but you got, the, you got the great value in the first part of this presentation. If you don't do what Fernando did, this stuff that I'm doing is kind of, I, I think, not as effective. You don't, you know, he, he's setting the stage of what he just went through to really then take it to the next level with what I'm doing. And what, I, what, I, what I'm going to be talking about, a lot of things that are hidden. But they're, they set a foundation for uh, sort of the, the, the function, the performance, and the affordability of what Fernando just presented, uh, taking it to that next step and looking at the structure itself. So we'll, we'll go through some stuff on the foundation, uh, some stuff on above grade walls, and um, then end up with some, some uh, parting thoughts um, that sort of cover a number of things. And I call it parting thoughts because there's just so much in this area we could talk about, it was a real challenge for Fernando and I. I had like 80 slides. And I was like, okay, how do I take, how do I decide which ideas to share or not? So um, where I fall short today, there is a handout that, that should have been posted that has the full set of slides and some more detail that will give you some things that are actionable and you can kind of think about and and perhaps you know implement if, if, they, if they work for you. So, I just wanted to get that out there up front. So we'll talk about um, some basic stuff on, on foundations. There's a lot of stuff in the code uh, that, you know, when we first started building, we didn't do it that way. Before codes, uh, concrete footings is not something that people started using when they built. They just used a rubble foundation wall, and that was it. They just started on the ground and went up. Concrete footings came later, and now it's like something you can't live with that. But uh, the code, Thankfully, now it does, if you look, uh, look at it carefully, allow you to build a foundation wall without a footing. You don't need the footing. Now, it, it, it may depend on the soil characteristics of the site so, uh, and the size of your building, the number of stories and things of that nature. So there's some math involved to figure that out. But if you've got a house or a design or a, or a site that you're building a number of homes on, it would pay off to look and see you know, if you can take some money out of your foundation. The other benefit of that, and it's not just in the material savings, but uh, you know, in this day and age, you know, concrete is the most carbon intensive material being produced. So when you remove concrete and do it in a responsible way, structurally correct way, you're, you've got a strong message for the environment uh, that you can also uh, bring, bring forward with doing this. So there's a lot of cases in the code. If you look at this huge table of all these different parameters of the soil bearing capacity, the number of stories supported, and so forth and so on, the footing sizes range from 24 inches wide, 8 inches deep, to 12 by 6 footing, which is the smallest size it has in a footing table. And in most cases, with just doing a simple soil test, you can get down to the smaller footing size easily. Um, and in many cases, you can get to no footing at all, for, particularly for a standard eight inch wide foundation wall, which I have a little bit of a gripe with the code because it kind of sticks you with that in some places. Um, but but uh, I've used six inch wide foundation walls a lot, not for basements, but for crawl spaces, uh, slab, uh, stem walls, and things of that nature. And hey, we use them for basements. You use them for basements. <laughs> I did one for basement, well, it must have been reinforced, so you can't do that with plain concrete. Um, it was it maybe a, a split level, Fernando. This is something that's also in the code, precast foundation walls. I found it odd when I looked at it. I hadn't looked at this in a while. I think it must be fairly new. But they have this huge, wide gravel supporting, uh, footing supporting a, a precast foundation wall. Otherwise, the same thing you can't cast in sight. But the gravel cannot spread the bearing load out that far. It can only spread it out approximately where I'm showing those red dotted lines. So the actual footing width is much smaller than what the code is saying it is. Now, I don't know whether, you know, that's, that just seemed really odd to me. The other thing that seemed odd is that for a precast wall, where you have all this quality control in the plan, 
the table for footings for the precast wall limit you to an eight inch wide precast foundation wall. Well, what's the point of doing precast if you gotta buy an eight inch wide wall when you only need six? So there's a, there's a problem there in the code and I just thought you can get around that. For, as Fernando mentioned, he and I have worked uh, on things like this and sometimes you, know, you have to spend a little money to save a little money. And that's the relationship Fernando and I had. But this is just an example. This is not one I did for Fernando, but it was for uh, affordable housing for, for uh, military at Fort Delvar. It's a six inch uh, stem wall. I did put some extra rebar in there. It didn't actually need it per se, but it just gives you actually a stronger wall than an eight inch wide and reinforced wall in terms of distributing loads across different soil conditions that might exist within the footprint of a building. So that was added in there. But, but other than that, it's just a six inch stem wall on a gravel footing. And, and you can do that. Um, the other thing you might consider, and I've done a couple of these types of foundations. Um, and I, I, to be honest, I don't know what the price of materials right now are for like a, the, the treated plywood, you know, below grade rated plywood, it's probably pretty expensive, but this is still, I, I would assume this is still very competitive with um, your typical concrete or masonry foundation. It's definitely competitive when you get into crawl space and slab and grade. Build this as a perimeter wall for your slab and grade. It's awesome. Um, so there's a couple of resources I've listed there that you can take a look at. Uh, one's more for designers. The other's more for builders. I really like the builder group. That's where I kind of cut my teeth with it. It just seems a lot more usable. It's put out by the Southern Pine uh, group. It's a very nice document. Lots of different ways to do this uh, technology. Um, the other thing that you need to think about is, is kind of, okay, well, a foundation's got to have some other things, so how can I leverage those other things to kind of optimize the value? So, you know, they have to be insulated. Um, and uh, so, you know, this, this little quick guide here is something that I think sort of helps you get your brain wrapped around the different options for basements, uh, slabs and grain and crawl spaces, but I'm only going to touch on a couple of examples here um, just to kind of throw them out there for consideration. So here's one way that I think is a great way to leverage insulating your foundation. Instead of the traditional insulate all the floor cavities above a crawl space, just insulate that perimeter crawl space wall and seal it off. And put a couple vents registers down there just like you would a basement. It's no different than a shallow basement. Of course, you've got a vapor barrier on the ground and those things. In this house, I actually put a mud slab because uh, it made it nice for storage. It was a tall enough crawl space that you could actually use it for storage. Uh, but, but you just insulate the perimeter and the floor is wide open. It controls the moisture a whole lot better. You're not letting moist air come in there and, and mold and all of that. It also creates a warmer floor above because you've got a condition stays below. Not only that, it saves energy because now all of your duct work and your mechanical equipment are in the condition space. You get credit for that in the energy code, actually. So um, a lot of value. That's leveraging different uh, things on, on the foundation to get the maximum value out of it. This is another one that I actually cut my teeth on at the National Association of Home Builders Research Center. Uh, it was my first job to to research this technology and kind of get it into the building codes. So the frost protected shallow foundation technology um, saves about $1,000 to $4,000 per home, just a typical home. And that's including the insulation costs because you're using the insulation not only to meet the energy code, but applying it to the foundation in such a way that it keeps the ground from freezing. So, you know, I've worked with builders in Fargo, North Dakota, or up in Alaska and Palmer uh, and in other states when we were doing the research to build foundation, Florida foundation in Alaska. Or Florida. There's a question of what we're looking at. What is the frost protected shell foundation? Okay, so what we're looking at here is a, uh, this laser is working or not? It's a four unit townhome slab poured all in one pour with a truss screed. All right. The Vertical edge of the slab has two inches thick of foam insulation. That was the formwork. The only thing he had was this header material as a band around the outside and some stakes and braces 
to hold that correct. It's only spanning a few inches, so the foam board was used as the form. You can see because we were in a very northern climate up in Fargo in this particular slab, there's insulation sticking out vertical, vertical over a pea gravel bed. The pea gravel is treated smooth, you know, with a two by four, and you lay your vertical, your horizontal insulation out. If you're somewhere, um, uh, or you don't even need that horizontal insulation, you can do this with just the vertical insulation, which you're using for energy code compliance anyway. Is this a mono slab system? A mono slab? It's a thick and edge slab. Yes, it's not a separate stem wall. And where we did it in Nebraska, Jay, I had a, a 60 inch or a 46 inch frost depth. We did it with 14 inches of foam. Yeah. That's a right. huge savings. It's a huge savings. And uh, if you look at the, the, again, the concrete reduction there, where it's a I think five or six foot frost depth, the concrete savings is incredible. So not only this, the net carbon savings, even with the adding the extra foam, the next carbon savings uh, I did it on your house. It was a smaller footprint than this. Um, it was like two and a half metric tons of, of carbon emissions that were avoided by using this technology. So again, not only are you getting the affordability of this, you, you're, you're meeting the energy code and actually putting money in your pocket or the consumers, you know, not having to pay as much. And, uh, but, but you're also saving carbon, which is a huge message, message and, and importance today. So this is just the map air freezing index. I actually worked with NOAA's scientists to climate scientists to develop this map years ago, but it's an air freezing index map, and that's what your insulation levels are based off of. And the amount of money you would save for a typical house kind of net lines up with the air freezing index. Where it's about a thousand, you'd save a thousand dollars, where it's four thousand, it's a thousand dollars. I just noticed that the other day when I put this together. Um, this is just a quick example of, of some of the slabs that, that I've worked with. Uh, the one picture in the middle you've seen already is another townhouse on the left. Uh, and you can see the cover board was a treated plywood in this case. There's lots of other things you could use to protect that insulation. The one on the right was the one I think is the coolest. Um, it's made with plastic lumber. Uh, so it's like a permanent wood foundation, except that's plastic lumber stem wall for a slab on grade. I think this was a three unit townhome. And I don't remember where. South Dakota. South Dakota. And uh, so that, that was kind of a cool. So that's just sort of an example of what you can do uh, with the technology, teaming it up with different foundation types. And here's another uh, sort of a cross section view of, of what that might look like for uh, the monolithic slab on grade, a uh, independent stem wall and slab. And that stem wall is showing a permanent wood uh, stem wall there. And then you use the treated plywood you would need to use to the permanent wood foundation. Anyway, you put that over the foam, you've met the code requirement for protecting the foam. So, you know, it's, it's used, looking at these sort of multifunctional ways to combine things, uh, say, keep the performance you want, and also cut, cut cost out of the house. So that's a great technology. So that's, we'll move on to above grade walls, and uh, we'll look at some, some basic framing stuff. The typical thing you'd look at, printing and headers, and then wall bracing, and, and um, again, look at it, leveraging insulation potentially uh, as part of your whole optimization process with the wall. And these are all interrelated. Decisions with what you make and how to insulate can affect how you decide to frame um, and what size frame you need. Uh, so, uh, as a rule of thumb, avoid high framing factors. If you see something like that in your picture, something is wrong with your planning. Or something is wrong with what your, how your framers are executing it, and um, it, you know it increases energy use, it's resource inefficient, uh, more studs cost more money, and there's just in conventional framing, forget about the advanced framing, going through sort of a quality control check on what's happening can save a lot of money. You don't have to like try to reach for the you know the premier advanced framing type stuff to save some money. So I'd encourage you to do that. And you can press into advanced trainings. And there's some parts of that that are quite viable and, and useful to look at. Um, and then, of course, the framing factor does its impact on performance of the building and what the energy bills are going to be do uh, relate to how you're insulating it. Are you using exterior insulation? Uh, if you're using exterior insulation, then pressing real hard with saving framing for the sake of uh, 
energy savings starts to erode because the exterior insulation is kind of blocking that thermal bridge anyway. So it, it's part of a decision process of framing and sort of insulation at the same time as to, to, to sort of where's the sweet spot for what you're doing. Um, the code allows you to do 24 inch on center framing if you want to go there. Um, for two by four construction, supporting roof only. For two by six, supporting one floor and a roof. I've done two story homes. It's two, two by six in the lower story, 24. Two by four on the upper story, 24. It's, it's easy peasy. I, I typically don't do the single top plate because then you got to make sure your framing above and below is aligned and all this type of stuff. It doesn't save that much energy or that much material. Plus, I like to be able to lap corners together, lap, make a good lap joint um, to be able to distribute lateral loads. Having been to a lot of hurricane events and surveyed buildings, I've seen a lot of them blow apart because folks aren't lapping top plates right into the corners and things of that nature. So there's some things you know you can press a little too far on, but the code allows you to do quite a bit. And my favorite stud is a two by five, by the way. I think it's sort of like the optimum of how much cavity insulation, a modest amount of maybe exterior insulation in the more northern climates. Um, it's just a great stud size, but it's not a common one you can find. I lived in a modular home that had two by five studs and, uh, and it, was, it was a great little house. And, um, but uh, you know, I don't know that you can get those cheaper than a two by six because they're just not being milled as much. You'd probably be more of a volume purchase type. All right, so uh, another thing that this is something I've worked on at the research center as well while I was there. Um, there's just a lot of applications where the, the headers that we're using are just plain overkill. You just put you know, two two by twelves across around everything and be done with it. And that maybe that's simple for certain reasons, but it's very wasteful. Most of your openings in your home can be served with a single header. And we worked to get that put in the code several cycles ago. So if you look at the code now, if you haven't looked at the code in a while, that uh, Fernando was holding up <laughs> with the date cover. Actually, you're pretty current. That's not too bad, Fernando. Good. And uh, you'll, you'll notice that there are single header options there. So that saves material. Also, you've got the insulation there anyway for the cavities. It gives you a better insulated home. And if you want to do a little more homework and math from an energy code compliance standpoint, you can get credit for that. For doing it and you can it can allow you to do some trade-offs and then you have more flexibility to do optimization when you start looking at framing and insulation again, how to sort of balance this the sweet spot there um, one of my favorites again another thing i worked on uh, doing testing at the research center was to 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 forget about the hitters completely in the wall and use the band joist that's already there as your head and uh, that's that's one of i think the themes and i'll get into it more later looking for the materials you're using already to get multifunctional use out of it. Rim joist is a perfect example. So most of your openings, uh, if you're using a single two by rim joist, that'll span that open, three, four foot wide opening. You don't even need a header in And you're just inhaling your, your joist into that, that uh, rim joist. Now, if you, your bearing area gets, you need to have a double header up there, there's not enough bearing area and then the code showing in this image here the use of some joist hangers and things like that it starts to erode some of the value of doing it at that point i'd probably go ahead and put it in the wall instead of trying to do the rim head. but there's, there's definitely a lot of possibility there that's, that's overlooked and the code allows you to do it it's in there so wall brace this is another thing that really thickened the code it needed to be addressed homes have changed they've got bigger larger uh, open spaces more lateral load being put on the walls because of steeper roofs, taller buildings. That's an anti-affordability thing. You pay for it in a bigger box, and you pay for it in having to make a stronger box. And because of that, the code got more complicated um, to be able to still build a safe box, a, a safe, the big home being as safe as the little home Fernando was showing earlier. And it's complicated. Um, and so there's 36 pages of code there. It's a challenge. Um, and optimizing that floor plan we're talking about, particularly when we get into bigger floor plans, where you place interior walls and using gypsum, using it correctly, not just the normal standard finish application. All of those things become affordability issues in making those plans work. But it's a complicated portion of the code. It makes it difficult 
to optimize for that reason. But the benefit is, is it's complicated. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in the way you can do it and learn how to ride that horse. And um, so that's, that's another thing that Fernando and I have worked on as well, too. Mentioned the drywall as, uh, as brace wall. Yeah, dry, I'll get into the drywall using that as a braced wall line. I, will, I do want to mention very quickly, uplift is critical. Most of the failures I've seen uh, from wind load, it's an uplift failure. Even though the building looks like it was pushed and racked and collapsed due to bracing, I've rarely seen a bracing initiated failure in a home. Rarely seen it. Most of the time what happens is you get uplift force that disconnects the walls, the house rolls backwards as shown in this wind tunnel test here. That's a full scale wind tunnel. And then it looks like it was a racking failure afterwards, but it was a pure uplift failure. So the code requires that. It's already in there, but there's, there's always an affordability option. So using these self-drilling uh, self screw, wood screws up through your framing, your plates, and into your trusses or down into your floor rim, man, it goes fast. You want people hanging up in places and trying to drive or put nails and things, and I use that now pretty much wherever I can. I'll use those self-drilling uh, screws for my wind uplift load pad. But it's important to brace. If you don't have the wind uplift load pads, you can break the path taken care of. You can brace all the walls you want, have no windows, and it's nothing but bracing, and the building will still come apart like it did in that picture I just showed you. So uh, the code being complicated, whoops. You go through this uh, process Step one, you lay out your braced wall lines. And this is where you can actually do a lot of optimization and adjustment in your architectural plan, depending on your building. Then you uh, go in and you select your braced, uh, bracing methods in step three. Step four, you determine a tabulated bracing amount from one of the tables in there, based on where you're, where you're building and your wind load, step five and six. Uh, you then look through and say, well, my roof is this pitch, so I've got that much roof creating load, and my walls are nine foot tall and you know or ten foot tall and that increased the wind load so you have all these adjustment factors you multiply all the adjustment factors from your basic bracing amount and then you look and make sure on that wall line that we were just checking that the brace panels can fit where they're supposed to fit a distance from the ends and, and spacing apart and then you look at you know the detailing how are they connecting to the floor or roof above and below and then okay i got through one brace wall line my wall my house is a big house that has 20 brace wall lines. Go back, do that now for the, the second brace wall line. And you do that process uh, multiple times, and there's, there's just gobs of opportunity to optimize. But from, because it's so complicated, people have a hard time even just getting through this process for one wall. So that's, that's a barrier to affordability, unfortunately. Uh, but there's a lot of value here to be mined. And so I'll just leave it at this. Uh, we taught a whole class on this last year and still didn't get into the details of it. There is a calculator tool that's available now that helps you go through that accounting process. And that's really what it is. It's like an IRS form. And I, this calculator is like TurboTax for wall brace. So I'd encourage you to look at it. It's not material. It doesn't limit you to somebody's material. It's basically focused on the most common materials like using gypsum for bracing, using OSB for bracing using leaded braces. I'm sure it'll be expanded to cover more options, but those give you a lot of capability to do, do some affordable things and also have strength when you need it. You can't, you can't uh, get around strength. So um, leveraging wall insulation, there's a lot you can do here. I'm kind of getting near the end of our time. There is a lot more in the handout as to how you can leverage wall insulation and cover a lot of different functions in the wall. And that allows you to perhaps in some cases, remove materials. You don't need a separate WRB. You don't need a separate uh, vapor retarder. You uh, have a wall that's uh, less prone to moisture problems. You um, use your gypsum for bracing in the interior. It frees up the exterior wall to, to choose other materials. So it's, there's a lot you can do there. I've, I've got a few ideas in the handout that you can take a look at. There's also another calculator tool that helps you integrate that decision-making process where you have to decide, well, how am I going to comply with the energy code? And then how do I comply with the vapor control requirements? And the insulation package you choose and the strategy is instrumental in coming up with the best solution. And you have to optimize the energy code and building code. This tool helps you to do that. It's not material specific. 
takes about three minutes to do the input, and you see results live, and you can change things and see what, come up with an optimized solution for yourself. Parting thoughts on the last couple minutes that I've got. Um, one, one of the things, you know, as you get to optimize, there's more and more continuous insulation being used. The code is added in information for how to connect cladding for it. So you can direct fast and cladding through it. Even direct fast cladding to OSB sheathing if you're using it, or a nail-based sheathing. So you don't have to worry about hitting the studs. Easy peasy. Uh, different ways of integrating with windows. Putting the flanges directly over the phone, most efficient. Easy to flash. Use the phone as your WRB system. They're code approved for that. It's the easiest way to, to close up your, your exterior and, and, and do it efficiently. Uh, but if you do it in any window, you need a separate WRB, but it's a different architectural appeal. And so you need to work through those kind of details whenever you're considering uh, the, the whole framing, insulation, and some of your architectural details. Multifunctional material use is very important. I'm just going to skip through a couple of examples. Just underutilized. It's a bracing method, and you see that red marker there, that's a column in the bracing code for gypsum. And you, you change your fastening space to seven inches on center, or four inches on center, the tighter the fastening, the more bracing you get out of it. And Fernando and I did a home that practically braced the entire hall no as, you know, with, with gypsum. When the OSB prices shut up sky high, we eliminated yeah. it entirely. Saved a couple thousand dollars now. And with the leaded braces, too, if you want to add those, or the temporary metal braces, uh, that works with gypsum as well, too. In fact, that's the traditional way 70% of the walls used to be framed not too many decades ago. We've, we've kind of forgotten that. But the code still allows you to do it, thankfully. Um, the other thing, multifunctional, there's now just a whole host of proprietary materials, like sheathing materials that contain insulation. They can also be the WRB, the air barrier. So in one material, one basically round in the building, and you've got all those functions taken care of. If you want to keep your continuous thin, insulation thin, use a, a, a insulated like vinyl side. Do I get the book now? Okay. So, uh, yes. so um, and, and, and that kind of allows you to optimize your assembly. Again, it's this multifunctional mindset. Now, you've got to look at the price of materials. You've got to get a decent price on it to make it work, worthwhile, but there's opportunity out there to do that. Finally, you can take all of those concepts and it works panelized. You can panelize these walls. These are images where that's actually happening in real time. I, this is a slide just thinking, rediscover some of the old ways, some of the panel sided materials. And I know some of them get a bad rap. But again, it's a, it's a siding material that can be used as the bracing and everything in one round. It's a great affordable housing concept. I've seen it done with a board and batten style. It looks really cool, it looks nice. Um, using the old wood lead and brace together with gypsum as bracing. That's the traditional way. It worked well for a lot of 1950s affordable homes that have not had any problem. Still standing and doing well. And don't forget the wind up load, up with load pad. My final thought, I worked for a post frame manufacturer for a while so as an uh, intern. It was my first sort of engineering job. Engineered a number of buildings, wrote the programs for their trusses and stuff. Um, they're highly engineered buildings very cost competitive, and if you can kind of work this type of structure into your housing plan, there's a lot that can be saved. Combine that slab with the shallow foundation, you've got post drilled uh, 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 posts that are your lateral bracing, you don't even need to worry about bracing, because it's like a moment frame at that point. Uh, it's a truss roof system, highly engineered, posts at eight foot on center, trusses at four foot on center, with purlins, and like that house that's shown there, I think there's a lot of affordability potential with this type of construction. So anyway, with that, I will um, uh, close. I think we barely made it. Uh, Fran, I'm glad you spoke a little bit.